Hello everyone, I'm Tasso Zachos, Editor-in-Chief of Fortune Greece and you're watching the Delphi Economic Forum. Uh, in this discussion session for the next 20 minutes, we are going to discuss about the future trends and we are going to discuss about how we can meet the challenges ahead. Uh, in order to start our discussion, I would like firstly to present our keynote speakers uh, for the discussion panel. We have uh, with us Mr. Blair Shepard, uh, Global Leader Strategy and Leadership of PricewaterhouseCoopers from USA. Hello, Mr. Shepard. Hello, how are you? Good to see you and good to be with you. Good to see you too. And also Mr. Yanis Mastrogeorgiou, Secretary General, General, Communication and Media, Presidency of the Government, Hellenic Republic, and also for Foresight Coordinator of the Greek Government. Hello, Mr. Mastrogeorgiou. How are you? Hello. It's really nice to see you. And I would like to thank uh, Delphi Forum once again for uh, having me here uh, with you. It's a great honor and opportunity as well. Nice. Uh, so in order to frame our discussion, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Shepard. Uh, I was reading your uh, uh, book uh, with the title 10 years to midnight, Mr. Shepard. And according to your research and data, uh, the world has 10 years to solve its problems and act before it's too late. In your book, you describe uh, four uh, urgent global crises. You examine the root causes of the crisis and also you suggest some strategic solution in order to begin to fix them. So I would like to ask you in order to start, how, how we should face the next 10 years? Well, I mean, I, I think we actually have to act really, really fast because the crises mm -hmm. we're describing are crises where you don't usually it would take decades to do something about them. And if we don't address them in the next decade, um, we probably don't want to live in the world that, that we have. So so we have to act really fast. And if we do, we could have a pretty good 10 years. If we don't, we could have a pretty miserable 10 years. So can you name uh, at first, uh, which are the four urgent global crises in order to discuss on them? So three of them are are um, are direct. Uh, the fourth one you could think of as a, as a consequence of the first three. So one crisis is a crisis of prosperity. So around the world, more and more people, those coming out to start work, those about to retire, and those in between, feel like the future is less attractive than than um, it was when I was when I was growing up and others. And, and when that occurs, they stop inventing, they stop creating, they stop thinking, they stop uh, doing, and, and therefore we sort of think ourselves into a, a, an economic uh, negative circumstance. The second one is a crisis of technology, and it is the two dominant technologies in our lives, the industrial system, how we grow things, transport things, build things, manufacture things, and the energy system. We have a decade before that becomes really very, very difficult to repair. Um, and, and then the second second system is one we're talking to each other, which is the impact of platforms on society and individuals. Um, the, the third one um, is uh, the sort of crisis of institutional distrust. The 18% of the world's population feel like the system's working for them. If you go back two decades ago, that would have been in the 70s. So people just don't trust the system. And when that, they don't, they, they stop working. It stops being effective. It's like systems are for us, institutions are for us what water is for fish. Um, and the final one is, uh, it's not clear we had the leaders we need to actually address those three crises as quickly as we need to. So, uh, Mr. Master, you, I would like to have your first comment on this regarding that Greece has faced a lot of crises during the last 10 years. For example, we have a, a, a crisis of institution. Yes, I would like to say, first of all, that um, I agree with uh, Mr. Shepard and what he said uh, before. And I would like to address, um, first of all, that thinking about the future has, has a, from our perspective, to think about future as a time, uh, not as a time frame, but as a mindset. We have to think about the future in terms of changing the way we are thinking about how we can form the future, not only to predict the future. It doesn't matter, to my point of view, 
to predict how things are going to be in 10, 15 years. Nobody can predict what will happen in 15, 20, 25 years. I didn't have the chance to read Mr. Shepard's book, but I read a lot of reviews and Mr. Shepard, that's a foresight promise I give you. I will read uh, the book, uh, the very first, right. first chance we will have in the next uh, few um, uh, weeks. So thinking about the future means that we have to change our mindset. To my point of view, the major crisis that we have to uh, consider how to tackle with uh, in the post-COVID era, that I think that we have to talk about post-COVID, and this is a, a, a gap in time that we had pre-COVID and post-COVID era thinking about the future, that the very best and the biggest thing and the biggest challenge is the climate, the climate crisis. All of the crises I think that we have to tackle and uh, to face, we are, we are going to have to think about it, um, how to, to, to be able to mingle people, future, climate, prosperity, as Mr. Shepard said, profit and business, in order not only to think about the shareholders and the stakeholders of the whole society. It doesn't make sense to me in the post-COVID era only to talk about profits. We have to talk about the four Ps, as I said, it's planet, it's people, it's profit, and it's purpose. We need to have the purpose for a better future. As we say, we should talk about sustainable growth, Mr. Shepard, correct? Exactly. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. I, I, I really agree with this point that actually the future is what we make it, right? All we're describing is what happens if you don't act, right? Um, and the reason the future is unpredictable is that humanity can act and change the future, right? But, but exactly. we need to and we must. And we need to understand how urgent it is, right? Um, so, so I, I agree also that actually what we that the the notion of the shareholder taking predominance over all others is problematic at a time when we are consuming the resources and we have the disparities we have of the kind we have, and when people just aren't trusting the system because of those two things, right? And and so we we have to sort of reframe how we think about um, the market economy and how we think about capitalism. Um, to actually understand that we're drawing on resources that will never come back, to understand that actually we have to worry about all stakeholders and all constituents. The good news for me, by the way, is that shareholders are coming to recognize that. Um, the, the, the smartest of the even private equity funds are saying, we have to worry about the world we're living in because the assets will have no value seven years from now if we don't do something about them. So there's convergence of interest. I just worry we may not get there fast enough. So we better get to it really quickly. Uh, Mr. Shepard, are the corporations and the business, for example, ready for this shareholder capitalist model? Uh, for example, we see that the investors now are investing uh, on ESG criteria, regarding ESG criteria. Yeah, I actually think the, I think the shareholder is actually ready um, because, because I think they, one of the ways to think about what's happening is if we do not address the issues I was describing, balance sheets will get destroyed. Right. Um, and shareholders actually really care about the strength of a balance sheet because that's essentially that's the thing they're buying. Um, and, and so I think you're seeing a rapid increase in concern. And, and if COVID gave us any silver lining, I think there's two. One of them is we understand that the world really matters um, and, and that we have to do something about it. And, and, and if not, value gets destroyed really, really fast. And then I think the second one is we learned we can do things massively and quickly. And so they're expecting us to act and act really fast. So I, I think actually there's good news on that front. And Mr. Master, you the stage, how ready, how are prepared for the changes that are coming? I think that we are moving towards this kind of direction. Um, I don't think that all the states have the same capacity and all the states uh, of the world have the same mentality, let's say so, about that. Uh, probably I guess that all the states we have to, to to realize that we are not going back to normal. We have uh, to moving towards a new series of uh, new normals, let's say so. Uh, business as usual, as I used to say, is uh, quickly fading away. 
And I think that the, we are living in a new kind of uh, permanent VUCA, as they say, which means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which is certain for the years ahead. Once we accept this, and once states accept this, once major businesses accept this, once uh, majority of people accept this, I think that we can find new ways to move forward and um, find and discover new possibilities for the world. Uh, organizations and states uh, should really and uh, rapidly uh, comprehend this and adapt to the future. Adapt, I guess, and my point of view is a key word um, in order to make change and resilient change, collaboration, agility, creativity, these kinds of words, I guess, are the major words uh, moving towards uh, the future. And creativity also will replace, for example, efficiency as the key objective of uh, the future. And we are, we are moving towards the great transformation. We are moving towards a new paradigm. Business as usual is over. We have to fix things again and um, consider how to reinvent and dare to think different. This is the time of dramatic crisis, which also generates radical uh, reinvention. Mr. Sapar? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if there's, this, mm -hmm. there's this triad of things that got us where we are, right? So it was our view of globalization is predominant and how that played. It was our view that technology is only good. And it was our view that essentially um, driving shareholder wealth and GDP were the, were the outcomes we were trying to achieve, right? We have to essentially rethink that entire model and, and begin with actually, if you don't have thriving local economies and communities first, it, it doesn't make sense to compete globally, right? We have to focus on making sure all parts of Greece are successful, then Greece is successful, and then the world is successful, right? Um, second thing is we, we have to understand that technology is both good and bad, and we have to be thoughtful about exactly. the good and creative and using the good, but, 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 but mitigate the bad. And then the third piece is we have to understand that actually GDP is too narrow a measure and shareholder value is too narrow a measure and be more inclusive in the measures we create. All three of those happen have to happen simultaneously if we want to achieve what we want to achieve. I worry a bit that that rethink is going to take a bit too long. So there's a couple of things we just have to get after right away and just do them. We have to solve the climate challenge and we have to solve the small business and inclusive growth challenge. Um, while we're rethinking the system, we have to act. So usually you could rethink, step back, rethink, and then move. We've got to move and rethink simultaneously. We're going to fix the plane while we fly it, I'm afraid. And, and I actually, I'm really thrilled by the kind of thinking I'm hearing from leaders like we see in Greece. And Mr. Master Georgiou, speaking about the climate crisis, is there a green, a green growth strategy now in Greece, correct? Yes, uh, we are moving towards this kind of uh, new paradigm. As I said before, uh, we really believe that not only Greece, but Europe as a whole and as a union, mm -hmm we have to face uh, the, the climate crisis and uh, we really need to see how our strategic autonomy as European Union uh, will provide us uh, with the benefit of being a green, let's say so, continent uh, by 2050. This is the challenge. This is the um, uh, our scope of business now. And this is what we do under the new uh, foresight uh, unit that the European Union has established a few months ago and all the member states are members of this uh, foresight uh, unit and uh, they have also appointed uh, ministers of the future as they call them and the first meeting will be in 17 of May in Portugal the ministers of the future will gather uh, together there and they will have the opportunity in order to examine uh, uh, the new uh, strategic autonomy of Europe towards 2040. Mr. Separd, is there a foresight green economy there? Is there a foresight tool in USA, for example, like in the European Union? 
There is a growing focus on the same sets of issues, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. you, you don't see a ministry of that, although we actually have a, have a climate czar, which we've never had before, right? Um, but there is an increasing focus on bringing innovation to the way we think about institutions and bringing innovation to the way we think about the economy. And, and so I think there is real overlap around the world that we need um, to create a sustainable economic model. Um, and and the, the interesting thing is that actually different countries are going to do it differently, but they agree on the outcome. Um, everyone knows we need to dramatically accelerate carbon equivalents, and we have to figure out how to get them out of the air. Um, and we have to do that in a way that sort of addresses the other crises. So we have to be more inclusive in how we do it, and we have to get people to believe in the institutions that make society work again. Um, and, and so I really am thrilled when I listen to words like innovation, when I listen to the kind of energy that's coming out of the conversation, because um, that will get all the people across the entire spectrum um, excited. My biggest anxiety is the kids giving up in the world, the, the recent graduates giving up because they just don't think it's going to occur. If we can stimulate that creativity and stimulate their commitment, um, the, the, the world has a pretty good future. If we don't, then then I worry a lot. And so uh, it's, it's they're very different language from what you would have heard four or five years ago. And it's really wonderful to hear, by the way. Mr. Mastoyer, you, I think we also need the young people to come back in Greece, for example. And we also need to keep the talents, the talents to keep the talents in the country, of course, and to keep the talents in Europe. No offense with you, Mr. Shepard, and the United States, yet you attract talents Good for you, good for the world as a whole. We have great innovation uh, coming from this uh, wonderful um, state. But in, in Europe, we have to also to take into consideration this kind of five dimensions, the social dimension, which means to keep the talents in Europe as well. Um, the technological dimension, the economic dimension. And uh, as you know, Greece and Mr. Zachos um, referred to that at the very beginning that we are facing a double crisis now, a crisis after the crisis. We had the, the economic crisis and now we have the COVID crisis. Um, we have also to pay attention to the economic dimension, cohesion, resilience, economic resilience, capacity to mobilize public and private resources. Um, of course, the environmental di dimension, we all said that and we underline this kind of dimension and the geopolitical as well. Um, the new partnership frameworks we have to uh, to see through uh, the, uh, you in the European Union with Africa, uh, with uh, Southeastern Asia, and the member states uh, should cooperate in order to build uh, more robust, I would say, defense capacities in Europe. These five dimensions are the, the pillars of the European strategic autonomy towards uh, 2040-2045. Okay, nice. Uh, Mr. Shepard, closing our discussion, I would like to ask you, what does a good future look like according to you? <laughs> so, so I think if you turn the things I described around and put them exactly the opposite way, the future is fantastic. So let's imagine instead of there being a crisis of prosperity, we live in a world of sustainable munificence that the people feel like the future is going to be fantastic and and they enjoy their lives as it is, right? So, so that's one dimension. The second one is let's imagine we learn to use technology in a way that actually is contributing and only contributive. Um, we have this wonderful relationship between people and technology. And let's imagine we solve the industrial system and, and the environment is a spectacular environment and the Greece, Greek skies are beautiful every day. Right? Um, and then let's imagine that actually people just trust their government, trust their businesses and trust their society so they can get on with their lives knowing everything will be OK. Right? Um, that's a pretty good world, actually. Um, and so we're kind of at a fork in the road. And if we go down the right fork, the future is really, really beautiful. Um, and if we go down the wrong road, the future is not very attractive. So I think we've got to get to it and get down the right road. Nice. Mr. Mastoyer, you, we should act now, as Mr. Shepard has said. And I would like to ask you, okay. closing this discussion, uh, you have established a foresight team within the Greek government. Uh, which are the pillars you focus on for the next years? For example, the digital transformation of the economy, the development of public infrastructure? Yes. 
correct. We have done that. It's the very first time that uh, a Greek government has established a foresight um, committee. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the very big, big thing is that it's under the auspices of the prime minister. And we are working uh, closely with the office of the prime minister. And um, what we are going to look for is that um, we have five four, five, four pillars and five or major uh, concerns, let's say so, about the future. The first one is a demographic one. The second is uh, the technology disruption. Of course, how we are going to transform uh, the way we work, the way we produce, and uh, the way we live, the way we entertain with um, the help of uh, technology, as Mr. Shepard said. We have energy and climate crisis. We have also the geopolitical dimension, We go, because you know, we live in a difficult, let's say so, <laughs> a neighborhood at the uh, south of uh, Europe, uh, south of Eastern Europe. And um, also we are going to, to consider about uh, the future of European Union as a whole, the future of the European Union as a unit of states. We are going to be a United States of Europe or, um, let's say so, United uh, Europe of States. This is a big, a big discussion. And one mm. last comment, Mr. Shepard, after 10 years of, of midnight, what else to expect from you and PricewaterhouseCoopers? Uh, so first of all, just a comment on Greece, right? Um, I actually yeah. think the momentum that was occurring before COVID was wonderful. The, the, the youth were coming back and, and Greece really needs that for the innovation and creativity that you're seeking. Uh, I think it's beginning again. And actually to me, if, if, if Greece, Greece gave us civilization, Greece can sort of show us the way back, right? And so I'm looking forward to that. Um, which I want to Coopers over the next 10 years is for us to be a partner in these activities. Um, we wrote the book, we believe the crises are real and we think we need to help as much as we can. And we're actually going to have an announcement in June that's actually pretty serious that illustrates it's our fundamental reason for being here. Um, and so I think we'll be a good partner, I hope, in helping process these issues because we are part of the institutions that makes the world work or not work and therefore we have our part to play. Uh, Mr. Shepard, Mr. Master you thank you for this art discussion. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you very much.